Welcome to the main post chapel here on this beautiful, clear, cold Christmas morning. My uh, car was saying it's about 24 degrees out there, but it is a beautiful, sunny Christmas morning. And I want to thank everyone who braved the cold to come out, particularly after our service yesterday. I'm going to have to use my command voice because our mic's down again today. So if you can't hear me, just wave your hand, all right? So Merry Christmas. And uh, I don't know if those of you who were here last night saw a very unique Christmas Eve service. Uh, I've been here about 10 years, and I will tell you, in my time of attending military Christmas Eve service, everything from our candlelit tent in Somalia to coming to a service here, I don't think that I have attended a service more unique than the one we had last night. So I would ask if everybody could kind of give a little bit of a hand clap of thanks to Chaplain McCauley for the service last night. Mike, it was a great service. Do we have any guests who are visiting us this Christmas morning for the first time, someone who's here in our service for the very first time this morning. Okay, well welcome. If you elected not to stand, this is your first time, we still welcome you here. A couple of things, there will be no activities after service today. This will give you a chance to get back home and get uh, with, your, uh, with your families. Next Sunday, the 1st of January, we will have fellowship but the normal first Sunday activities are, is going, are going to be postponed until the second Sunday in January, which will be the 8th. So communion and parish council meeting will be the 8th. Next Sunday, we will have service and we will have activities after, uh, we will have fellowship after service. Again, we're looking for volunteers to help uh, us take down the decorations. Uh, chapel is, is beautiful. But on Saturday, the 7th of January, at 0900 hours, we'd ask as many people as possible, please come to the chapel, help us take down the decorations and pack them away. There are a couple of things that are going on in January. One big one is Chaplain Helm, who is the 18th Court Chaplain, will be preaching here on Sunday, the 15th of January. As far as the flowers, if you purchase the point seven, if you purchase one, Please feel free to take them after service today uh, because, you know, we do have to start clearing the chapel out. Uh, last call here is uh, we, I am going to be working through the lay reader and the greeter roster over the next week. So starting next Sunday, we'll have a draft copy of the schedule for lay readers and greeters through May. We'll pass those out. Let you take a look at it make sure that everybody's clear on the dates that you're going to be doing that. If not, then you just come back with me and then we'll make an adjustment. I think that's the big thing here. One last thing. Since today celebrates the birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I think it is appropriate that this being also the last Sunday that we celebrate anyone who had a birthday in December. So do we have any December birthdays? December birthday. Oh, I that. Anybody else besides me? <laughs> you December? Yeah. Oh. Was yours last Sunday? It was. No, it was mine. Oh, well, happy birthday, Bill. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? Yes. One, two, three. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Papa Sheets. Happy birthday to you. I think that's all the announcements we have for today. Before we pass the peace, I'll check the chaplain to see if you got anything. Okay. Chaplain Collins? Okay. And, and one, one, one last little tweak here, if you didn't buy one, the, the, the Sergeant Major here has informed me that you can still take one if you'd like one, but you have plenty of them. <laughs> all right, let's all please stand and greet each other on this beautiful Christmas morning. Pass the peace. <laughs> Good morning, girls. Good to see you.
Christ, Merry Christmas.
Merry Christmas. I'm going to be reading from Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. And if you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it's on page 1590. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Curtius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone in their own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with his, excuse me, with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room at the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and a babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those that heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, all the things they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Mary kept all these things in her heart and pondered them. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. That was a beautiful reading from Luke. I love how the Lord, the creator of heavens and earth, stepped out of his heavenly throne and entered into our realm. He walked the same dirt through which we walk every day. And that's a comfort that we have. But, beloved, this day is not a day that we just celebrate the birth of our Savior, but we proclaim the reign of our King, King Jesus. So this morning when we uh, recite the catechism, it's in the handout on the sheet that's separate from the main bulletin. There's three questions. It's from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's to proclaim the three different offices, but mainly to focus on the third office, the office of king, the king of Christ. And it's question 22, 23, and 26. I'll read the unfolded, and you will respond in the bolded uh, print. We're not going through Psalm 90 that you see in the bulletin, so it's just this this morning. So question 22 says, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Answer, Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and born of her, and yet without sin. Question 23 says this, What offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Answer, Christ, as our Redeemer, executed the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his state of humiliation and exaltation. Question 26 says this, How doth Christ execute the office of a king? Answer, Christ executed the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and dominion us, and restraining and conquering his and our enemies. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. And that is the hope that we have as Christ our King. Because this day is the day that our King was born. And beloved, as a good King, our King would want to hear our request. What's on our hearts and this morning as we enter the time of congregational prayer, praying up to our King. What are your prayers this morning so that we can render them as offerings and praises to him? Anyone? Yes, sir.
the peace surpassing all understanding, that he may truly rest in your son this morning. Now, Lord, we do pray that you guide him to execute godly laws, laws according to nature that you have designed us to have, to uphold justice and equity throughout the land. Father, thank you so much for our president and all the leaders of office that's above us. Lord, let us just be as respectful and supportive as we can, but yet speaking truth. Father, we pray for our, U, uh, our United States Army, all the leaders from the 18th Airborne Corps, 82nd Commanders, all the way down to platoon sergeants and platoon leaders and squad leaders and team leaders and regular soldiers, Lord, all those who are here standing in formations. Lord, be with them this morning. Let them know that they are truly blessed because you have provided them such an opportunity to serve this nation. Lord, thank you so much for this area of Fort Bragg. And Lord, be with the families this morning who are here celebrating your day. And Lord, we are praying also for those who are traveling. Lord, we pray for traveling mercies for those who are going to and from their homes. And Lord, we just uh, pray that the weather will uh, uh, ease up for travel. And Lord, be with the, the traveling companies, airline companies, the baggage uh, workers, and all the all the. Uh, people behind the scenes. Be with them. Give them comfort. Lord, give them the, the sense of duty and accomplishment from this season, knowing that they have done a good thing helping people travel back home. Father, we looked up a couple of, uh, I would say, serious prayer requests uh, and, and what's heavy on our hearts, Lord. We looked up the Doss family back in Evans, Georgia. Lord, we pray for Adam Doss and his family. Lord, we pray that though they are in anguish, missing their father and husband, Lord, that you will comfort them during their affliction. That though, let, though they may be slain by you, they will trust in you more and more each day, O oh Lord. Lord, we lift up uh, uh, Sheila Williams, who lost her mother. Lord, we pray for peace, the Lord, and comfort as well, knowing that losing a loved one is never easy, and especially during this season of Christmas. Lord, be with that family, the Williams family. And Lord, we lift up Aunt Judy to you this morning, knowing that she has gone through health issues. Lord, we pray that your great hand will be upon her to, to, to preserve her life and to heal her. But most importantly, that she may see your good grace and, and purpose through these health issues this morning. Lord, be with Judy as well. Lord, we lift up a deputy of 23 years of age who lost his life in the line of duty. Lord, a life so young and, so, and taken so early, Lord, be with this family. I don't know if that man was married or if he had kids, but Lord, he was a son or a brother to someone. And Lord, be with this family this morning. And Lord, protect our uh, uh, police officers and firemen and all the first responders in all areas this day, knowing that this day could be a day that can lead to tragedy. And Lord, thank you so much for those first responders who are our comfort and rest and protection each day. Lord, we lift up um, uh, Steve G, Lord, who is going through chemo. I didn't get the last name, but Lord, do you know who Steve is and what exactly he is going through in his life? Lord, we pray that you help him through chemo, that his pain may be eased. And Lord, that he may rely on you and see the goodness of the cross of Christ Jesus in his life. And Lord, we lift up Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Fossey's family, Lord, that they have lost a loved one during this time of Christmas. Lord, we just pray that your grace and your love and your purpose be more evident in the Fossey family's life more than ever. And Lord, thank you so much for great leaders who serve this country, who live a life of duty and honor for us to follow in. And Lord, thank you so much for everyone who showed up this morning on your Lord's Day, on your Christmas Day, to celebrate you, not just at the birth, but your entire life the conquering of sin and death. Lord, thank you so much. And as we end with our prayer, Lord, we end by saying that prayer you taught us to pray down in our bulletin on the second or third page, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Next.
is the tithes and offerings. I know we cannot ask God more than what he has given us this day. We are blessed just to come. And this is our way to bless not just this chapel, but this area. So during this time for uh, tithes and offerings, let this be a time of cheerful giving. May I ask the ushers to come? Jesus, we pray these things. 
Amen. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain, vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in a sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the, the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, all ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye be perished from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This concludes the reading of God's word. Amen. 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 One of the reasons why I love Christmas is because most of the hymns that we sing, that we proclaim this season, not only focus on God's good grace that was incarnate in human history, but we focus on the kingship of Christ. For example, I love the lyrics of the song, Hark the Herald, for it says this, Hark the Herald, the angels sing, glory to who? The newborn king. We can look at, O, o come ye faithful. The lyrics likewise say something similar. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold, what? Born the king of angels. And probably my favorite Christmas hymns around this time is Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her what? King. Let the earth receive her king. Do we sing these words without realizing the meaning behind them? What does it mean that the king has come? Do we say these songs just out of tradition? What does it mean that Christ is king? This season is a time to reflect not only on God's good grace in our lives that was incarnate in human history, but to, it's a time to focus on God's kingship, on Christ. I tell them this sermon as the birth of the uh, true theocracy, God's rule throughout the world. I really want to focus this morning on Christ's kingship uh, in all the world by looking at Psalm 2. I want to really break this psalm up in three different sections. The first section I have is uh, the kings of the earth, found in verses 1 through 5. Second section of this psalm I, I have broken down is uh, uh, God's king, found in verses 6 through 9. 6 through 9. The last part of this uh, psalm is a great warning to all peoples, all earthly kings, found in the last three verses, 10, 11, and 12. First section, kings of the earth. The psalm, psalmist begins the psalm with these words. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The Hebrew word for heathens is actually goy, which is typically translated as nations or Gentiles, so unbelievers. I want us to see what is being said here this morning, beloved. The psalmist is painting a picture of a mass of a specific type of people. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. The unbelievers, according to what the psalmist is saying, have gathered and imagined a vain thing. I love what the ESV actually says. The nations, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? These unbelievers coming together, plotting to rage, not just a pain thing, but war against God and his anointed. So we have this picture of this great mass gathering together against God's purposes and his Messiah. We also see something a little bit more particular about this gathering of uh, unbelievers. It says that they are led. We see in verse 2 that these the, they are led by the kings of the earth. The unbelievers have kings of the earth, leaders of the earth, leading them to gather against God and his anointed. But notice what verse 2 says about the kings of the earth. It says this, the kings of the earth, what? Have set themselves. They have set themselves, beloved. These are self-appointed leaders who have made a league with each other to rebel. They are making a stand, as it were, drawing a line in the sand to do what? To fight God. These are what these unbelievers and their leaders are doing they have come together and they want to rebel against god now, this is really the fruit 
of Satan and his, de uh, his deception in the garden to our first parents when they fell away from grace. This is the fruition of Satan's plan as he sowed sin in the world, and this is his harvest springing up. Now we have these kings of the earth leading these mass of unbelievers against God and his Messiah, which we see in, in verse 3, that they want to come and break the bands as under, or break the bonds and the cords they want to cast off from them. They want to break away of God's sovereignty in their lives. We see that their uh, objective here. That's their objective, to break away God's sovereignty in their lives. They are gathering together in one purpose and goal, to break and cast away from God's rule. They want to be rebels. They want to revolt against the only God that provides everything in their lives, including the very air that they are breathing in. They want complete freedom from God. They want complete freedom from God. Notice what's happening here in verse 3. The unbelievers, the heathens, as the King James has it, are raging together, and a vain thing do they plot, and that plot, their mindset, unites them together in a common goal of total autonomy. This is because their mindset is set on death and destruction of love. We have people this morning in our culture today, likewise, like these masses of people. Matter of fact, we have politicians who think they could put into law whatever they want with the stroke of a pen which is lawless against nature itself. They want to call this a respect for marriage. It's not really respect for marriage or an act of what God has instituted in creation. We have people who want to define what a man is and what a woman is. And they want to do what they want. They want to break the bands or the, the bonds of God's sovereignty in their life. They want to go against their own very nature. For those who want to be a different gender, they are literally going against what God has said in the first chapter of Genesis. It says this, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he, him. Male and female created he, them. Our society says, no, we create ourselves in our own image and our own imagination. They say this because our culture doesn't know what distinctions are anymore because they want to break away from God's sovereignty in their life. There's no more distinctions, beloved. There's, what is good is evil, and what is evil is good. If you truly ask the question, if there's any good or evil in the world, they will say no. There are no more distinctions in our culture. As a matter of fact, if you ask them if they love God, some will say yes, but their actions say otherwise. If you ask them if they love Christ, they will say probably no. These are the same people we see all around our culture today who scream tolerance, and yet they're the most intolerant. They want diversity, but when diversity comes through our Christ, our King, they want to persecute us for being different. I want us to see something here this morning. This morning, and this uh, first three verses, is actually for our edification, beloved. The sin begins from within, and the same sins begin in the wrong mindset and a wrong heart. These un unbelieving people in our psalm and in our culture today, these kings and politicians that are leading these people and this mindset on set on rebellion against God, it's because they want full autonomy, full self-rule. Full reliance on themselves from the creator of the universe. It is as if Satan is advising the unbelievers, hath God truly said, sowing doubt and sin in the hearts and minds of the people all over the world. And also likewise saying, ye shall be gods, knowing good and evil. The irony is, there is no good and evil nowadays in our culture. But what is God's response to the first uh, five verses? We do have a response and we see that actually uh, in verse 4. It, it, it's, it's this great rebellion against God for a purpose of autonomy. And we see God's reaction. He says in verse 4, uh, He that sitteth in the heavens shall what? Laugh. He shall laugh. And the Lord should, shall hold them in derision. Look at God's posture here. He is sitting. He's sitting in his throne in heaven. God is not surprised by the heathen's thoughts or, or their efforts to rebel against him. God is sitting down calm in a posture. Second, God's reaction is priceless to me in this song. His, he reacts in laughter. The idea of these unbelievers having full autonomy away from God in creation 
but it causes God to laugh at them because it is the very God that gives them everything, even the ability, the will to rebel against them. It's God that provides for everything for them, even the very strength. And he is maintaining their life even now. And he laughs at that, saying, you know, this is my translation, saying, like, do you realize how you are doing this? It's by my very hand. I'm giving you time to repent. And there, God has a response for them. In verse 5, we see that response directly to the kings and the people of the world, the unbelievers. He shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Beloved, God isn't speaking to them in his grace. He's not speaking to them by the mercy seat so, so much that we love and cherish as Christians. We run to the mercy seat of Christ. God is speaking to these rebels by his wrath. That's something to be afraid of. Something for us to tremble. Because we know how severe the wrath of God is. We know that it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. For our God, according to Hebrews 12, is a consuming fire. Hebrews, by the way, is the book of the New Testament. And these are the kings who are testing that wrath, testing that fire, testing that great sore displeasure in their lives. The second section I want to focus in is verses 6 through 9. It's focused on God's king. God says this, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill in Zion. Look at what God is doing here in the midst of his enemies. Instead of destroying them by the power of his word, which God can, and by his holiness he should, but because of his grace, he's implementing his king in the midst of his enemies. He is setting up his earthly rule for a theocratic century, or better yet, Christ-centric rule in all the world. And while the unbeliever, unbelieving peoples, tribes, and nations gather together against God, he sends a king and establishes him on his holy hill, Zion. Look, we have God, who is so gracious, installing his king, while the earth is actively rebelling against him and his rule. Love it. Notice what God does. He places his king in Zion, the holy hill. And if you remember about Zion, the holy hill, that's, the, that's where Jerusalem is at right now. Right? So God is placing his king on his holy hill. And remember in 1 Samuel where David gets the Ark of the Covenant. He brings it up to Mount Zion. He places it there. And it's to represent God's not just holiness, not his rule, but him dwelling with his people. And God is saying, I will place my king in that very dwelling of all people before their eyes in Mount Zion. Solomon did the same thing. That's why Solomon built this beautiful temple to, to represent the God's dwelling and with his people. What is so significant about this location is that it's God's holy dwelling in the midst of his people. And this is something that we can truly rely on, knowing that God has condescended down to us and he's dwelling in the hearts of his people, the true Israel of God, those of faith, the children of Abraham, us, beloved. This is what David says about that. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Zion represents every aspect of that, every aspect of God's throne, kingdom, and power. Beloved, this is, of course, a prophecy about Christ. We can look at the psalm, and we see that God is declaring to the world, before the incarnation of Christ, that his son will be king. And this is how the New Testament church has always understood Psalm 2. We can look at Acts Chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. And see what uh, what they said here in the early church about Psalm 2. This is them quoting it. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ, for of a truth, against his holy child, Christ Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. Do you see that there, beloved? We can check out, actually, Acts chapter 13 as well. Paul proclaims this, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, that he hath raised up his son again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
Look at verse 7 real quick, beloved. Verse 7, he says, I will declare the decree. God's decreed this before the foundations of the world, but yet he also declared this to David, his king, saying that he will set up his king, his own son, as ruler over the whole earth. And beloved, this decree cannot be broken. It cannot be reversed. It cannot be changed. This is what God has said according to his nature, and he will ensure that it will come to fruition. I love what the Westminster Confession of Faith says about God's decree. And this is a summation of what Holy Scripture teaches. This is what the, they said. God, from all eternity, did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet as so thereby neither is, is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of creatures and humans, nor is the liberty of our will or contingency of the second causes taken away, but rather established. This is what we find in Peter's testimony in the church in Acts chapter 4, this time, verses 27 and 28. And if you want, beloved, go and read that later today, Acts chapter 4. This is what Peter says, Against thy holy child Jesus, which I quoted earlier, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel hath determined or predestined before to be done. You see that there, beloved? The centrality of God's decree is on his king, the man of his right hand, according to Psalm 80, what we preached about last week. And nothing in this world or any other world could change that. God had made a decree to set his son up as king over the entire face of the earth, and nothing in this world could stop that. The heathen, the nations, the unbelievers, the both Pont Pontius Pilate and Herod and the Jews, the Pharisees, they tried to crush that, and they thought they did by crucifying our Lord. But God said, as part of the plan, that if you knew what you were doing, you would not have crucified my son. That's how God changes and redeems this world. He reverses their expectation and uses what they thought to their advantage to exploit it to their greatest weakness. God's king, in fact, has a kingdom, and this kingdom isn't like any kingdoms of this world. This is what Christ actually said to Pontius Pilate that day when he was led to be crucified. His kingdom is not of this world. Nonetheless, Christ truly rules over all things, including all peoples and all governments. Look at verse 8 with me for that evidence, beloved. This is the Father still speaking to the Son. He says this in verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Christ the King has all authority. He has every kingdom. That's his earthly inheritance. The nations, the peoples, the tribes, every tongue, every clan. You could imagine that is Christ. Not some nations. Verse 8 says all nations. All nations. That is why in the temptation. When Satan came to Christ, especially in Matthew chapter 4, where we read the last temptation was actually Christ on top of a mountain, picture of Mount Zion, real quick, but a false one, a pseudo Mount Zion, and Satan shows him the nations, and he says this to Christ, if you just bow down and worship before me, I will give you all these nations. Satan knew that Christ came to redeem these nations. He knew that Christ will come and conquer his enemies, and he tried to give Christ an easy way out. You don't have to go to the cross, Christ. If you just bow down and worship before me, you can have all of them. He knew that, beloved. The nations were always God's objective. Psalm 72, verse 8 says, talking about the Messiah, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 2, prophesying about Christ's earthly rule, he says this, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, holy hill of Zion, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow up to it. So we have this picture of this prophecy of nations flowing uphill against gravity to the mount of Zion. This is what Christ says on the top of a mountain in Matthew 28. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
Beloved, if you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, your Redeemer and King, then you are a part of this inheritance. Beloved, this is a great reversal, especially in the Jewish eyes, because how many here are bloodline Jews? I am not. Most of us are not, probably. And this is the beauty of God's grace. This grace was poured out onto all nations, and he's redeeming them, and we become children, heirs of Abraham through faith. Look at verse 8, beloved. Verse 8 is about the extent of Christ's inheritance, but now verse 9 is about the supremacy, the rule of this inheritance. Look what it says in verse 9. And this is still the Father speaking to the Son. He says this, Thou shalt break them, the rulers, the heathens, with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Nothing in the world can destroy Jesus' sovereign world, uh, rule. No matter how troubling the world is out there, no matter how much chaos we see on the news and how much trouble that we have in our own personal lives, there's nothing outside of Christ's control. I've said this so many times here in chapel, I'm quoting Abraham Kuyper, but there's not one square inch in all of this entire universe that Christ does a screen mind. He owns it all, and he rules it all, and he's guided it all for the purpose of his glory. And he is using this time of patience and long-suffering to transform the world and to spread the gospel message so that the church may have the fullness in the earth. I love the language here in verse 9, though. The psalmist, David, describes these nations, these kings, as pottery. They're clay vessels. This is similar language that Paul uses in Romans 9 when he ex explains God's sovereign grace. This is Paul speaking. He says this, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and the other to dishonor? Christ is he who has the ability, the power, the authority, and the might, and the duty to execute his will throughout the world, throughout all peoples and nations and tribes. I, no, I love, I love this description the psalmist used because... The potter's vessel, the clay pot, in other words, is, is fragile. It's fragile. If he wants, he can break it. He can put it back in the fire. He can mold it to whatever way he wants. That should really make us really think about who we are before God. We are nothing but vapor before the wind. And that's what God wants the leaders to know. They are fragile before him. If he so chooses to do so, he can cause their kingdom and their might and their rule crash before them. The last section is the great warning, the great warning. That's our last section, verses 10, 11, and 12. These last verses is God's giving a warning to the unbelieving world and her leaders as a command. This isn't a suggestion. This is a command. He says this in verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, O ye judges of the earth. God is directly speaking to the leaders of the earth. Love it. This is a, a, a command, not just for David's day or right after Christ's ascension. No, this is for all ages until Christ comes back. I want us to check out this word instructed here, because in the Hebrew it's it's used differently in different ways. It's usually a warning or a ch ch uh, ch uh, chitasmin way of speaking, but it's a word really, if you want to look at the metaphor of it, it's a word that a father would use to to correct his son, his disobedient son, and it's used to describe the rulers as disobedient sons. What the rulers of the earth are trying to do, they want full autonomy, but their duty, we find actually in verse 11, it says this, to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Beloved, you may be wondering if this applies to us today in the 21st century. Yes, it does. This applies to us as a nation, the United States of America, today. This applies to our president, Joe Biden. This is why we pray for him every week. It applies to all the presidents before Joe Biden, to Trump, Obama, Bush, Clinton, all the way back to Washington. It applies to every king of the earth, every leader, every dictator, every prime minister. This applies to everyone who leads. They are called, in Romans 13, deacons of God in this world. And their job as leaders are to promote good and to... to to uh, judge evil. That is their job, to restrain evil and promote good by applying the moral law in this world. And they fail to do so, then the Lord will have them under great condemnation. 
And look at what God says in our end of this chapter, last verse, verse 12. Kiss the son. It seems odd because I was reading that. I was like, why kiss the son? It makes me think of Judas. But the ancient world, when you kiss a leader, a king, you're paying homage. And that's what we have in 1 Kings 19, verses 18. This is God speaking to Elijah, talking about how he still preserved 7,000. I have left me 7,000 servants in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal, nor have they kissed them with his mouth. And when God tells the kings of the earth to kiss the son, their responsibility and sole purpose is to pay homage to Christ the king. If they don't, then they will be perished by the way. But the psalm ends with a great promise for us all. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him, the Son. Let the earth receive her king, right? Application. First application is pray for our leaders. Paul teaches us to pray for our leaders. First Timothy 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings of all authority. We are commanded by God to pray for our leaders, including the leaders that we do not like, even if we think they are the worst. Why? Because it is God who has established them to be rulers over us. Praying for them shows that we are supporting God's sovereignty in our lives and the lives of the world, and we support God's plans. Second, this might be kind of counteracting the first one, but it doesn't. Call out our leaders. Even though God has established our leaders, it is our Christian duty to call out the world, including our leaders, when they err. Just like John the Baptist did over and over again with Herod when he took his brother's wife. And Acts 12, we actually find out what happened to Herod. Herod was so full of himself that he took on praise. He thought himself to be like a god. And judgment was executed. And that's post-ascension, by the way, beloved. Nonetheless, we are called to call out our leaders. And we do it in a way to respect them, to uphold their position. We do not undermine them, uh, their uh, position of duty. We do not rebel against them. We are not revolutionaries. No. We must obey God rather than men, but God has established these men and women over us, and when they err, we must call them out with respect, show them where they err, and do so in a loving way. The third, pray for the solemn league and covenant. That might be a different language that we're used to, but let's pray for God's covenant in our lives and also in the life of our nation. Love and pray for the nation that we may repent and enter a league of covenant with God. We're not Christian nationalists. I don't believe in that. <laughs> if anything, you'll probably call me a Christian globalist because I desire, as much as the, uh, the prophets have desired, to see the entire world be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. It is a calling, our calling as Christians to preach the gospel to all people and to see godly nations rise up. And one means of this is if the nation does come and repent before God and covenant under them. This is one means through which God shows his glory. This is what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 50. Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Pray that our nation may enter such covenant in the future. In the meantime, let us continue to preach and proclaim and pray the gospel for all peoples everywhere. Beloved, thank you so much for joining here at the Main Post Chapel this Christmas Day, let the earth receive her king. Christ is king, who has all authority and subdues all of his enemies and our, ours. Amen. <laughs>
bless you and uphold you through your duties this week as we proclaim his resurrection and proclaim his gospel of peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Amen.